Welcome back to the Joe Miller Show, KON Hot Talk, 1080 AM, 95.1 FM. This show is made possible by the MacPherson Tax Defense Group. 1-800-BEAT-IRS, beatirs.com. That's B-E-A-T, IRS, serving Alaskans, Americans since 1978 with two generations of tax defense attorneys. We have online with us Dr. John Zimrak. He's been on this program before. I won't go into a lot of detail on his background because you know it already. He's been a press secretary to a pro-life governor, been very active in writing with the stream at stream.org, contributing senior editor there, and recently wrote a pen to story, Planned Parenthood and the Gift of Death, of course, a new Planned Parenthood video out again. Dr. Zimrak, thank you for being willing to talk about your article and the new video on the Joe Miller Show again. Thank you. So uh, talk to us a little bit about this new video, what's in it, Any anything. Well, of course, it's kind of hard now to be shocked, right? All, right. all of us that have watched right. all the videos are a little bit numb at this point. Let me just give you a little background, give you a, a chance to think about the question. I talked to Rand Paul yesterday. He's been going throughout Alaska and asked him about how his colleagues are reacting to these videos. He told me, he said, first of all, from his perspective, very, very difficult to watch the videos, but he's very activated. And I think he's really being genuine about it. But it's very disconcerting to hear that there aren't too many people in the Senate that are outraged. So apparently they have not been numbed yet. What in this current video, the newest video, is uh, give us kind of the highlights, some of the things we ought to write our elected leaders about to try to activate them on this issue. Well, this new video is uh, an interview with an official of STEM Express. And he, he, they make it perfectly clear the STEM Express uh, pays Planned Parenthood directly for particular organs, and that Planned Parenthood does it to boost their revenue stream. So I, I think the maker of the video was very clear in what he was doing. He was trying to give these people a chance to admit to violating federal law. There is a federal law against profiting off human organ trafficking. Um, it's never been very well enforced. Clearly, it's being violated by Planned Parenthood. And uh, David Delighton and the heroes at the Center for Medical Progress were purposely asking questions that would lead pe- lead the people at STEM Express and at Planned Parenthood to reveal whether or not they were, in fact, violating federal law. So we, I think we have enough evidence that if we had an honest president, the Justice Department would be investigating Planned Parenthood and STEM Express and a number of other companies for violations of felony, felony violations of federal law. Instead, we have Obama, um, the same man who's going to be greeting Pope Francis in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, doubling down on spending more than $500 million in taxpayer money every year to this supposed nonprofit charity called Planned Parenthood. Um, I think the power of these videos is that it has taken away our excuses. People in America, a lot of them, Consider call themselves pro-choice because they were they were resting on hazy, fuzzy, bad science, uh, lack of education. Remember that Roe versus Wade pretended to a kind of scientific agnosticism about when life starts. Well, it's pretty clear that something that is human enough to have organs that can be used for transplant, it's got to be human and it's alive because you don't get transplants from the dead. From you know you have to get transplants right. to something that's alive. I wrote I penned an article last week where I said the walls of the American death camps have come down. I mean it's there for all of us to see now. You're right, we are without excuse, and that's actually a pretty scary thing to be in, where we now no longer have an excuse. There's no longer a claim of ignorance. We have to act, otherwise we can face. I think, extreme consequence if we don't. And I believe that that's part of the reason why we're now hearing out of the House of Representatives, at least among some in the Tea Party Caucus, a real commitment to stop any funding that includes Planned Parenthood. That's good news. Of course, it's going to create a real conflict between the leadership on the Republican side and uh, the grassroots-supported, real-deal Republicans. I think that's actually another good thing. But I think we can expect a shutdown as a result of it. I think if if we can count on the Republicans to use the constitutional power of the purse, which was our founders put in the Constitution on purpose, they gave the House of Representatives the power of the purse, the power to originate all spending bills. Uh, the Republican co- Congress has been incredibly timid about using this constitutional power. I mean, 
what's the good of the Constitution? Does the Constitution just exist so that Justice Kennedy can make up new rights out of it and that it can be used to give birthright citizenship to anchor babies? The Constitution was not created for those purposes. It was, in fact, created so that our legislators could rein in the power of the president. But because of it went badly once in 1995, Republicans are supposed to be timid forever about ever shutting down the government, ever refusing to fund evil programs because it might look bad for them on TV. People are wondering, what is the point of voting Republicans in? And I think the entire phenomenon of Donald Trump can be traced to the futility of electing Republicans over and over again, only to have these nervous Nellies in the leadership turn them into Democrats. Yep, I don't don't disagree with that at all. I don't know whether you read Steve Dace's article the other day on American politics and uh, kind of the Trump phenomena, but but you've hit it on the head. I think a lot of us are thinking that it really is that that's the reason why people really don't care about where Trump's been in the past because he's different than the two parties that have sunk the country. Let's just turn over. We've got five minutes left here to your article, Planned Parenthood and the Gift of Death. Tell our audience a little bit about that article, what motivated it and kind of what the action points of it are. Sure. What I'm saying is that, you know, death is a terrible thing. We all face it. It, it haunts us. We wonder what to do in the face of it. Uh, a, lot of our, a lot of religious faith deals with finding ways to deal with the reality of death and hoping for life after death. But one of the most fundamental things that human beings have done since the dawn of time that helps us deal with the reality of death is to reproduce ourselves to think that we're passing on life to another generation. We are fulfilling our role on this planet, and then we're going to give way. Like, we're, we're in Act 1 of the drama, but then there are new actors coming for Act 2. And it's our job to prepare the way for the next generation, to care for them, to love them, and then be willing to step aside when it's our time. You know, we're going to die. I think this generation has a different attitude. I think we want and somehow feel we have the right to live forever and to do whatever we want, to live exactly as we want. We're not going to be bound by any biology. We we aren't bound by the sex that we were born into. We can pretend to be whatever race we want to be. We're acting like a generation of utterly spoiled children who want to keep the planet for ourselves. And one of the ways we're showing that is by not welcoming another generation to replace us. Throughout the West, including the U.S., the birth rate is well below replacement. We are not replacing ourselves. And in the last, you know, since Roe v. Wade, in America, we have aborted 54 million children. That is only 4 million fewer than the Soviet Union killed in its death camps and its gulags and its starvation campaigns. We are approaching the Soviet level of innocent death. That says there's something profound going on in our culture. We are not willing to welcome the next generation. We're not willing to care for them. Children are receiving lower and lower priority as we pursue our adult gratification, our adult satisfaction. And um, we, you know, that's, a, that's the recipe for a nation with no future. Europe, Europe, the birth rate in some countries is 1.8 per woman. That, that's well below the replacement rate. Uh, it's no wonder that another culture, the Muslims, are stepping in to just take the continent away from them. Are, are we going to do the same thing with you know, Central America and Mexico? Will they just have to come in and fill the vacuum we're creating because we're aborting all our children? Yeah, that's one of the things that people don't realize is that abortion really has created the vacuum that's uh, caused a lot of these corporate interests to push hard for the illegal immigration, for the you know, expanded immigration policies. I mean, we've killed entire, well, I mean, full generations. I mean, the impact, when you think about those that could have had children that were killed clear back in the 70s and 80s, the impact's far more than the you know, 50 or 60 million that we've killed. It's probably, you know, something like 80 or 90 million additional to our population. It would have, of course, it completely un- eliminated the need or the type of immigration policies that we've had. Who knows how many Einsteins and how many inventors and other extraordinary individuals that we've killed. It's just, it's, it's a mark on the society that is going to be very difficult, I think, to survive from. What we have to do, and our very survival depends on it, is activate, and I appreciate your efforts in that. Dr. Zemrak, hopefully we'll have him back on in the next day or so to talk about Islamic immigration. Be back with you 
Talk more about this other issues after these messages. Welcome back to the Joe Miller Show, KOAN Hot Talk, 1080 AM, 95.1 FM. This show is made possible by my friends at the McPherson Tax Defense Group. 1-800-BEAT-IRS, beatirs.com, B-E-A-T-I-R-S. Serving Alaskans, Americans since 1978 with two generations of tax defense attorneys. We're honored to have with us Dr. John Samarek. He's the contributing senior editor of The Stream. He received his B.A. from my alma mater, Yale University in 86, a few years before me, M.F.A. in screenwriting and fiction, and his Ph.D. in English in 96 from the Louisiana State University. He has also acted as a press secretary for pro-life Louisiana governor. Mike Foster been very engaged politically and, of course, a prolific writer. Just always impressed with his writings. We put a number up on Restoring Liberty, one of the most recent ones that we'll put up tonight. Mass Muslim migration to Europe is suicidal and misguided. Christian compassion enables it. Dr. Smarek, thank you for being on the Joe Miller Show to talk about this important topic. Thank you, and it's very important. So, you know, we're hearing almost weekly stories about tragedies out of Europe, of people packed on boats like sardines, you know, boats capsizing, even worse, you know, Muslim radicals throwing Christians off the side of boats before they illegally dock in Italy. What is going on in Europe? Well, what's going on is that the, there are millions of people in North Africa who don't like it in North Africa, who don't find economic opportunities. There's no welfare state. There's very little social support. There tends to be political chaos. All the things that are side effects of having a Muslim society. Rather than moving to another Muslim country na- n- nearby, which they could do perfectly safely, they are risking their lives to get on boats to sail to the European welfare state. They are headed for Italy, but once they get in Italy, they, they're confident that they can make their way up to places like Norway and Denmark and England with elaborate, lavish, cradle-to-grave welfare programs. Now, some people say, well, these, these people, they're going to work. They want to work. There are no jobs for them in Europe. Europe has double-digit unemployment in virtually every country, um, especially high among low skill low you know low education entry or young entry level laborers <clears throat> in fact like something like 40% of people under 30 in Spain <clears throat> are actually unemployed there are no jobs wow. for these people what there are are there are slots on the welfare gravy train which are paid for by european taxpayers who are already crushed by heavy taxes to the point where they have you know they, they have few, very few children one of the reasons is they're so heavily taxed one of the reasons that I've heard that Europe is trying to basically induce this is because of that inverse birth rate. Countries like Germany, Italy, they can't produce enough children. But what you're saying is unemployment's already sky high, so that really isn't a driver. Well, you know, first of all, if you want, if if, if your country rather than have children, do you just want to import Muslims? You've already gone past the brink of insanity. <laughs> I mean, right. can, can you imagine? <laughs> if, if you well, imagine what, what, if you, you. What are the numbers, John? The last number I saw is that 600,000 North African Muslims are preparing to get on boats to sail for Europe just this year. And the impact on the future population numbers of Europe, where are we at right now? I mean, if you've got it on a country by country basis, we're just. I, I, don't, have I, mean, it, what... I don't have it broken. I don't have it broken out. But let, let me point out this. In the last 10 years, virtually every act of terrorism committed in Europe was committed by a Muslim immigrant or the children of Muslim immigrants. Every act of terrorism. Virtually all the anti-Semitism that is driving Jews out of Europe and finishing Hitler's work by clearing Europe of Jews because they're fleeing to Israel, that's not old French Nazis. That is young Muslims who have been imported there to, for jobs that don't exist. Europe is being colonized by Muslims. It is being conquered by Muslims in the same way that our ancestors or the founding fathers conquered North America from the Indians. And I'm I'm simply appalled to hear Christian representatives, principally Pope Francis, 
present this as some moral imperative that Europe must lie down and allow itself to be conquered by these people and pay for the privilege by supporting them on welfare all their lives. It's and disgraceful. Just so, just so our listeners are clear, Dr. Smarik, you're actually a Catholic, right? I've written six books defending the Catholic faith, but I can't defend Pope Francis's personal views on immigration, which, by the way, don't accord with what's in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. They don't accord with what previous popes have said and done about immigration. When, when the popes had their own country, the papal states, they didn't allow millions of Muslims to move there and take over the cities and build mosques. Far from it. And do you see the same sort of, as you put it, Christian compassion motivating in part immigration policy in the United States? Yes, and I don't, I, I don't think it's Christian compassion. I think it's something else. I think it's leftism. Um, I, I think churchmen in America, especially uh, my own Catholic bishops, they are constantly yelling for open borders. But then when you look closely, you realize that they have government contracts with the federal government to resettle those immigrants. Every right. time an illegal immigrant gets an amnesty in America, the Catholic Church or one of its agencies cashes a check. Not just that. One out of three American Catholics leaves the church during his lifetime, according to the Pew poll. Where are they going to replace those people? They can't apparently or don't want to try to pass along the Catholic faith to the next generation of Catholics born in America. So they're just going to import new people to fill the pews for one generation. Then those people can lose their faith because their bishops are doing such a bad job, but they'll just replace them with more immigrants. It's like throwing cannon fodder into the front line of the machine guns in World War I. If only it were just Catholics that they're bringing over. I mean, it turns out that a huge number, as you, of course, noted in Europe, is the Muslim immigration issue. But even in the United States, I mean, the huge number of refugees that are being resettled by the Obama administration, they're disproportionately Islamic. I mean, the, the persecuted Christian minority, from one of the guests that we had on this program, apparently barely even registers in numbers. Oh, that's true. In fact... Um, I, I know I know a woman, Juliana Tamaruzzi, she runs a group for persecuted Assyrian Christians, and I encourage you people to look at his, her website. It's victimsofisis.org. Uh, that those people can't get out of Syria and Jordan and Turkey. They're all stuck in refugee camps, the Christians. They can't get, in, they can't get to boats. They can't make it to Europe. The, the people who are coming to Europe are m m m members of the same exact sect religious sections of Islam that, that created ISIS. They're intolerant Orthodox Muslims, which means they don't believe in religious freedom. They don't believe in freedom for women. Why do you think there's an epidemic of female genital mutilation and honor killings in countries like Belgium and the Netherlands and France? That's all because of Muslim immigration. And it is frankly unchristian to disrupt your society, to put people on welfare who have never paid into it, make strangers pay for them to live, uh, and totally make your country ungovernable, meanwhile screwing over your native poor people and native working class, all in the service of a false, distorted, leftist version of Christian compassion. And the ultimate end of this, I mean, by the Islamic group's own admissions, is that in two or three generations, Europe will be practically unrecognizable because of the immigration that's, that's occurred. That's right. You have in England, you have you have Muslim preachers who are living on welfare, preaching in mosques in London that Islamic law must be imposed in England. I mean, this is the country that single-handedly fought off the Nazis for in 1940 and 41 before the U.S. got in the war, and and here it is surrendering to these itinerants who just show up and, and with their hand out. I, I, I'm really saddened by what's happening in Europe and to a lesser degree in the United States. I think the anger over immigration in America is palpable and it's justified. I, I think Donald Trump is not the best spokesman for it, and he actually I don't think is putting the best face on the rational reform of immigration policy. But there are candidates like Ted Cruz and Scott Walker and Rick Santorum who are making a very strong case that we must look out first for poor people in America. How about people whose ancestors fought in World War II, whose ancestors were slaves? We owe those people 
a chance at getting on the bottom rung of the ladder and building careers. We, we shouldn't be constantly importing new workers to compete with them, to drive down their wages, to make sure that no one in the working class ever gets a decent wage in America again, because they can always be replaced with the next person from across the border. Thank you, Dr. Zamarek. One of the things we need to do is be a little bit more straight in our talk about what's going on with radical Islam. It's not compatible with the U.S. Constitution. Be back with you after these messages, The Joe Miller Show.